Last week we talked about Abram as a soul winner, that it appears he uh, already was collecting up souls in Haran, and that uh, he even kind of became this father figure to Lot. We talked about Abram as a rich man, that uh, he exercised obedience to the higher call, um, but uh, that really just entailed leaving his father's home. It didn't entail total material renunciation. And uh, we looked at what the scripture says regarding being rich, that the rich in this world are to be rich with good works and are to be liberal with their wealth and use it to bless others. We talked about Abram bearing the shame of the cross, that his name as exalted father would have been um, uh, somewhat uh, shameful or difficult to bear as he's entering into Canaan and he doesn't have any biological children of his own. And yet being promised that this land and, uh, uh, would be given to him and his children. And lastly, we touched on the idea of worship as warfare, that Abram enters this land and he plants his flag of the altar of this public declaration that Abram as uh, a, uh, an invader from heaven is saying this land belongs to my God and my God has promised the land to myself and he does this um, because he knows that we don't wrestle against uh, flesh and blood but we wrestle against uh, the powers and principalities of darkness and how do we do that we do that through worship uh, we do that through our particular cultic expressions of worship like on Sunday mornings um, with uh, our rituals and our, our liturgies, but we also do that with the entirety of our lives, offering our lives as uh, sacrifices, offering our bodies as living sacrifices, offering sacrifices of thanksgiving and gratitude with our mouth. And so that's what Abram does. He builds this altar. And then what else does he do? It says he builds an altar and he called on the name of the Lord. And that's a curious phrase, and that's what we're going to spend today talking about, calling on the name of the Lord. And I'm not totally satisfied we can answer what that means. What does it mean to call on the name of the Lord? I'm not satisfied we can give a, an exhaustive account of what that means, but I think we can uh, start swinging in the right direction. I think we can uh, uh, start scratching the surface a little bit. God is infinite, and so we can always explore um, uh, who he is even more. We can always discover more riches uh, to his depth. And I think that this phrase and everything that it entails, there's a, there's a simplicity to it. I think we all know what it means to call on the name of the Lord, but I also think that there's this poetic depth to it. And, um, uh, and so we're going to kind of explore a little bit of that. Both of those things in tandem are kind of the Christian life in general. There's straightforward simplicity and there's kind of inexhaustible poetry to it as well. And that's what I think is, uh, that's what we see with this phrase. So uh, first, I just kind of want to go through each, each of the major parts of the phrase uh, just really quickly um, uh, to call in the name of the Lord, talk about call, name, and, and the Lord. Uh, the first word call, the Hebrew word kara there, it means uh, to speak verbally, to proclaim, to cry out. Uh, to read aloud, to utter a loud noise, to uh, call onto somebody. And so uh, this, I think, uh, is not kind of the quiet meditations of the heart. I don't think it is a personal, private, silent prayer. And even in, uh, I've, I've read that in the Jewish uh, tradition, that if you don't verbalize a prayer, it's actually not a prayer. You have to speak it. And I think that there's something profoundly uh, God-like about this. God speaks creation into existence. Words matter. Life and death is in the power of the tongue. With our mouths, uh, we are creating worlds. And so I think that this is uh, important to keep in mind as we go forward to call out. It is a, it's something deeply visceral. It is a crying out. It is not simply the quiet private meditations of the heart. Next, uh, why call on the name of the Lord? Why not just call on the Lord? Why, why is there this distinction? And I, I don't know totally, but this distinction is made everywhere in scripture. You see this all over the place. It's constant. Uh, people petitioning God, do this for your name's sake. Jesus telling us to pray Every day in the Lord's Prayer, hallowed be your name, 
when we're praying to, to the Father. And I think what a lot of that comes down to, what I think the name aspect it is essentially a way of drawing our attention to God's reputation. That's what I think it's about. Um, and Proverbs 22, 1 says, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. These things are contrasted. Uh, this repu a good reputation, a good name is to be chosen rather than great riches. And favor is better than silver or gold. And also, I think that this is seen in, uh, in the Ten Commandments. Um, uh, I think it might be the Eighth Commandment. I'm not sure. However, you're numbering it. It's not simply don't lie, <laughs> um, which is a, a, a complicated <laughs> issue in itself. But it's not just don't lie. It's don't bear false witness about your neighbor. Well, what are you doing when you're bearing false witness about your neighbor? You're sullying their name. And we are made in the image of God and we all have names. And our names, when they're sullied in a way that is undeserving of who we are, of our essence, of our being, of what we've done, that person is to be put to death. <laughs> that's a capital offense to slander somebody's name. And so um, that's what I think um, invoking the name of the Lord has to do with God and his reputation, God, uh, everything that entails God's being, um, God being trustworthy, uh, God uh, being uh, creator, God, powerful, all of these things, I think when we're calling on his name, draws our attention to uh, his reputation. And then lastly, um, calling on the name of the Lord, if you, if you notice, um, and you see this all the time in the Bible, and this is another instance of that, um, Lord is, is all, is, it's all caps. Uh, does anybody know why that is? Why is every time, in, there's, almost every time in your Bible, not every time, but when it, when it talks about calling on the name of the Lord or just referencing the Lord, it's in all caps. And what that is, is it's a, it's a hangover from Jewish tradition of not knowing, essentially, or being afraid to pronounce the name of God. And the, the term that is there, the, the word there is not Lord. The Hebrew word for Lord is Adonai. And it's not translating Adonai. It's an, it, the word there is Yahweh or Jehovah, Jehovah. We don't really know how to pronounce it. There's educated guesses. I think Yahweh is probably the best, but the word there is Yahweh. And so when you see Lord, it's actually Yahweh. And the, the, um, the handout that I gave you is uh, what's called the, tetra the Tetragrammaton. I think uh, I'm saying that correctly. And those are the four, uh, those are the four letters, uh, uh, Yod, He, Vav, and He. And, um, and we're not quite sure what the, the vowel, those are all consonants. We're not quite sure what the vowel pronunciation is. Um, uh, Yehovah, Jehovah is taking the vowel pronunciations in Adonai, which is Lord, and trans transferring those vowel pronunciations to those consonants, and that's where we get Jehovah, and that's uh, that's a whole thing. But uh, most likely, it's probably Yahweh, um, and so uh, that is the name that's being called there. And this comes from when uh, God reveals Himself to Moses, and He's in the burning bush, and He says, "I am that I am. I am who I am," and uh, I am. Uh, the Yahweh is uh, most likely uh, some kind of contraction of I am. A lot of, the, a lot of that is it's pretty difficult. It, there's a lot of complexity to all of that. But calling on the name of the Lord is calling on the name of Yahweh. That's what's really, that's what's really going on there. Um, okay. So those are kind of the three constituent parts of, of this phrase. Other, other traditions, instead of saying Lord, um, 
And we would do this, yeah, so some traditions will say the name instead of saying, uh, instead of saying Lord, they'll just say Hashem, which is Hebrew for the name. Um, so th yeah, so anyway, there's a lot of stuff to all of that, but that's what's going on there. All right, so calling on the name of the Lord, what does this mean? One of the things that it means is to sacrifice. It's associated at least with sacrifice and perhaps the calling on the name of the Lord, calling on the name of the Lord itself is a sacrifice. Abram calls on the name of the Lord in conjunction with building an altar. Well, what is an altar? An altar is a cultic expression of, of, of worship, uh, particularly sacrifice, a sacrifice made to God. An altar can be an altar of incense, like in the tabernacle, or when John sees the worship service of heaven in Revelation, he sees an altar of incense there, which uh, are the, represent the prayers of the saints. Uh, an altar can, be, um, can have a, a grain sacrifice, uh, like in the tabernacle, there was grain sacrifices that were brought, and these grain sacrifices are an expression of thanksgiving to God. An altar can have blood sacrifice. Blood sacrifices are an expression of, uh, of atonement for sins. Um, and this is what we, saw, we see in the outer courts of the tabernacle uh, later on um, in Israel's history. Uh, and then in 1 Corinthians 18, or uh, 1 Kings 18, excuse me, Elijah, he calls on the name of the Lord and he sacrifices animals in... Uh, the showdown on Mount Carmel. You, we see these things together there. Um, first, uh, first Kings 18, it says, Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left, a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it, and I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of Yahweh. And the God who answers by fire, he is God. So here is a calling on the name of the Lord, preparing animal sacrifices at an altar. And the operating assumption here that Elijah is uh, working with is that when he calls on the name of the Lord, that what? That Yahweh is going to respond. <laughs> that he's going to answer. Um, Psalm 99.6. Moses and Aaron were among his priests, and Samuel was among those who called on his name. They called upon the Lord, and he answered them. So calling on the name of the Lord is done with an expectation of God answering. And not only answering, but answering with demonstrations of power. And with Elijah, it was a demonstration of fire which consumed the sacrifices, which also indicates God will, be, God will accept you. That's what that means. God uh, accepts these sacrifices. Well, the sacrifices in the fullest expression of the term is us. We, we give ourselves to God and God accepts us as, as a sacrifice uh, through Christ. So uh, calling on the name of the Lord is done with an expectation that God will answer, answer by demonstrations of power, not by rational argumentation, which is a strength of uh, kind of uh, the reform stream, not by rhetorical persuasion, perhaps a strength of more of the Catholic stream and their kind of uh, gifts of aesthetics, but answering by power. And that's kind of a gift of the Pentecostal stream. They realize that God answers by power. Power that publicly demonstrates God's superiority over other gods. So calling on the name of the Lord has these expectations connected to it. For Abram, uh, in our passage in Genesis 12, uh, we're not told that he sacrifices animals. We have to infer that. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. Um, I think it's safe to assume he did, but we're not explicitly told. 
And so perhaps his sacrifice at the, at the altar was simply calling on the name of the Lord. That was his ascension offering. Who, I, I, who knows? I, I don't know. But either way, either way, calling on the name of the Lord is placed together with an altar, placed together with sacrifice, sacrificial worship, and an expectation uh, that God will return an answer in supernatural power. Uh, does anybody know the first place that we see men starting to call in the name of the Lord? First place in scripture. Yeah, right, right before the flood. Yeah, it's, it's uh, with uh, Enos, or Enos, uh, who is the son of uh, Seth. It says he, he, he bore Seth in Genesis 4, or, or uh, Seth bore Enos, and then from that time men began to call on the name of the Lord, began to call on the name of Yahweh. And um, so I think there is also another um, side-by-side somewhat of calling on the name of the Lord and animal sacrifice because we are told Abel offered uh, the first fruits of his flock animal sacrifices to God which were acceptable to him and then Cain offered his grain sacrifices and they were not um, for whatever reason if that was an inward heart disposition or if it was the nature of the sacrifices if it needed to be a blood sacrifice I don't know but uh, Abel is killed. Seth is kind of this typological resurrection of Abel. He replaces Abel as kind of a resurrected uh, Abel. And his son Enos, and, the, uh, and then from Enos, um, uh, men began to call in the name of the Lord, which would have been a time of distress for men at that time because you have the Cainite, uh, Cain's sons, multiplying and vengeance can't be taken on them. Remember God marks Cain. And so the world becomes increasingly violent. And um, uh, so it would have been a time of earthly distress. And God answers through the line of Enos, Seth, all the way down to Noah. He has favor on Noah, saves his family. And so there's this kind of salvific uh, aspect to it. So calling on the name of the Lord is an act of petitioning the Father for deliverance from earthly distress. I think we can gather that from uh, back in Genesis 4 and in the, in the flood, the kind of antediluvian world. Uh, the psalmist uh, affirms this as well in Psalm 116.4. Excuse me, then I called upon the name of Yahweh. O Yahweh, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. So here we kind of have an introduction a little bit more of uh, a spiritual deliverance. Um, 116 is, is also about earthly um, deliverance and kind of our earthly and spiritual lives are um, inextric inextricably linked. There's not really, you can't uh, part the, parse these things out, um, you know, uh, in kind of an absolute discrete sense. But we see here that Calling on the name of the Lord is, is here a petitioning for deliverance from distress, from earthly and spiritual distress. Calling on the name of the Lord is also a way of stirring up yourself to take hold of the Lord. Isaiah 64, 7 says, And there is no one who calls on your name who stirs himself up to take hold of you. And so calling on the name of the Lord is a way of wrestling with God, kind of like Jacob and the angel of the Lord. Uh, it's a way of evoking yourself, kind of pumping yourself up to wrestle with God, not letting go of that angel of the Lord until he blesses you with wounds and you have the dignity of walking with a limp for the rest of your life because God blessed you. Calling on the name of the Lord is a way to kind of internally um, stir yourself up and to call on him to take hold of him, to grab hold of him. So again, I think there's this, there's this deep visceral kind of aspect to it as well. Calling on the name of the Lord is associated with purity and service to God. Zephaniah 3, 9, For then I will restore to the peoples a pure language. God doing this unilateral um, kind of monergistic action of restoring the people a pure language, kind of a, a restoration of Babel in a way. 
and, and why does he do this? That they all may call on the name of the Lord. So calling on the name of the Lord is preceded by a restoration of pure language. And why do you call on the name of the Lord? To serve him with one accord. And so calling on the name of the Lord, the fruits of that is service to God. It will result in service to God and also with one accord done in unity with other people who have had their lips restored, their language restored. So there's this corporate dimension to it as well. There's a purity dimension, a service dimension, and a corporate dimension um, that calling on the name of the Lord is done with other believers. Psalm 116 talks about this. Psalm, the whole psalm mentions uh, calling on the name of the Lord uh, on three separate occasions. And it culminates with sacrificial worship, uh, which is done in the midst of other believers in the assembly. Uh, Psalm 116 uh, reads as the following. What shall I render to the Lord for all his benefits toward me? I will take up the cup of salvation and call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay vows. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people. Um, I will take the cup of my salvation, I think has kind of sacramental uh, undertones to it. Calling on the name of the Lord, culminating in doing this, making vows to the Lord in the assembly. Further, uh, further on, it says, I will offer to you a sacrifice of thanksgiving. I will call upon the name of the Lord. I will pay my vows to the Lord now in the presence of all his people in the courts of the Lord's house in the midst of you, O Jerusalem. So calling on the name of the Lord is a public thing that you do with other believers in the assembly, a petitioning of God in the context, in a worshiping context and not in the I mean, we can we obviously can petition God in the prayer closet and Jesus commends that kind of prayer closet piety. But we see here that calling on the name of the Lord is done with the rest of the body. Calling on the name of the Lord also involves uh, not only deliverance from earthly and spiritual distress, um, but also vengeance on the wicked. Lamentations 3. So Jeremiah is speaking here and he says, I called on your name, O Lord. From the lowest pit, you have heard my voice. So again, he's in this, he's in this period of distress. He's appealing to God uh, for, to hear his voice. Do not hide your ear from my sighing, from my cry for help. You drew near on the day I called on you. And you said, do not fear and uh, also, you know, draw near to the Lord and he will draw near to you. Part of that uh, calling on the name of the Lord uh, is, is, is petitioning God, taking hold of God to draw near and God answering. Well, how does God answer? He says, do not fear. Don't be afraid. And then uh, he says, oh, Lord, you have pleaded the case for my soul. You have redeemed my life. So there's kind of this redemption aspect, but then he continues, Oh Lord, you have seen how I am wronged. Judge my case, bringing up these grievances of injustice. You have seen all their vengeance, all their schemes against me. God, you've seen these things. You have heard their reproach, O Lord, all their schemes against me, the lips of my enemies, and their whispering against me all the day. Look at their sitting down and their rising up. I am their taunting song. And then he goes on. He's talking about these injustices done against him by wicked men. And what does he say? He offers this imprecation. <laughs> Repay them, O Lord, according to the work of their hands. Give them a veiled heart. Your curse be upon them. In your anger, pursue and destroy them from under the heavens of the Lord. So calling on the name of the Lord is redemptive. There's deliverance involved. It's a petitioning, taking hold of the Lord. And it is a redemption that involves justice on the wicked, on the ones who uh, are uh, irreverent and who have taunted God's people. 
uh, when he says, repay them, O Lord, according to the works of their hands, I believe it's, I think it's 2 Timothy 4.14. I'm not totally sure, but uh, somebody treated Paul poorly. Um, and I, it's a coppersmith. I can't remember his name. I think it's his name's Alexander, Alexander the coppersmith. And Paul says, uh, the Lord will repay him according to his works. He explicitly says, he treated me poorly. May the Lord repay him according to his works. Um, so I don't think that this is just an Old Testament thing. We are whole Bible Christians. These things all harmonize together, and we are to bless our enemies, uh, you know, bless those who curse you, you know. Jesus says, forgive them, Lord, for they know not what they do. And yet the prophets of God are constantly praying these prayers of imprecation on enemies. And so um, that, that tension is there. I don't necessarily totally know how to harmonize it, but it is harmonized. I suppose we can appeal to Ecclesiastes, there's a time for everything. <laughs> um, but uh, so that's another aspect of calling on the name of the Lord. We call on the name of the Lord for his justice to be administered to the wicked. Uh, we, we rely on God to make all things right. We don't take vengeance into our own hands because we know that God is a God of vengeance and that his vengeance is far more satisfying than anything that we could cook up in our minds. Um, so God is merciful and God is gracious, but he's also just. Um, and uh, yeah, Psalm 79, 6 is, is a similar thing. Pour out your wrath upon the nations which do not know you and upon the kingdom, kingdoms which do not call upon your name. So that's, this is another kind of imprecatory uh, uh, association with calling on the name of the Lord or with those who do not call on the name of the Lord. There's kind of the inverse. Those who do not call on the name of the Lord, God's wrath is, is, uh, is, is imminent, is near. The, the threat of God's wrath is, is um, resting on people who do not call on the name of the Lord. And then the last one that I have there on the outline is salvation and baptism. And this is probably the most common one. You may have had this in mind when we started talking about this. Um, uh, uh, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved, right? That's, uh, I think we've all heard that before. Well, that's from Joel. It's from the prophet Joel, uh, chapter 2, verse 32, that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved or delivered. And uh, Peter uh, he references this in his sermon at Pentecost. Uh, he says in Acts 2.21, And it shall be that everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so Peter's preaching this to, to God's people who are there for, at Pentecost, offering their sacrifices. But he preaches to them their sin of crucifying their Messiah. And then we read this. Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart, and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises to you and to your children and to all who are far off, as many as the Lord will call. And so we see here an association calling on the name of the Lord, is associated with salvation, repentance, forgiveness of sins, and we see it paired with a cultic expression of baptism, which, uh, we, where we receive the remission of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Um, and, uh, and then also uh, Peter says, uh, you know, do these things because the promise in all of these men, these God-fearers and these Jews are thinking the promise, well, the promise is, they're automatically thinking Abraham and the promises made to Abraham. And Peter says, the promises are to you and to your children and to all who are far off, add, adding this kind of Calvinistic addendum, to all who the Lord will call, <laughs> right? Uh, as many as the Lord our God will call. So uh, calling on the name of the Lord, baptism, remission of sins. And Paul, this happens with Paul too. Paul has his conversion um, and then he goes to Ananias and everything's good, right? Because Paul believes Jesus. Uh, he's, he's ready to do the work of God and he has forgiveness of sins already, right? Well, uh, what Paul recounts to us is um, 
Ananias' exhortation to him in Acts 22.16. And this is what Ananias says to Paul. Paul's already converted here. But Ananias says this, Arise, be baptized, and have your sins washed away, calling on his name. So again, this calling on the name, calling on the name of the Lord, and baptism, and forgiveness of sins. And uh, uh, lastly, uh, we see this also in uh, Romans 10. This is probably the, the, this is where my mind went when I started thinking about this. Um, Paul mentions this, and the larger context is this. In Romans 10, Paul is uh, basically giving an exposition of the law, of Deuteronomy 30 specifically, and that's an incredible study in itself. But basically, Deuteronomy 30, there's a section that he's quoting from, and in Deuteronomy 30, this section essentially says, don't think that these things are far away. Don't think that you have to go across the sea or you have to reach into heaven. Or These things are near, and you know them, and you can obey them. That's basically what this section is saying. And, and Paul quotes Deuteronomy 30, 14 in Romans 10. He says this, uh, this, is from, this is the law. This is the Deuteronom Deuteronomical law. The word is near you in your mouth and in your heart. This is, and then, and, then this is, and then he gives a commentary on it. That is the word of faith which we preach. So the word of faith there is embedded there in Deuteronomy, which Paul is preaching. And, he sa and then he explains it even further. That if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus... And believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart, so he's drawing on this deuteronomical mouth and heart uh, uh, phrase. And he says, for with the heart one believes unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is to made unto salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. It's a reference to Isaiah 28, 11 in the Septuagint. For there is no distinction between Jew and Greek. For the same Lord over all is rich to all who call upon him. For whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. So what's going on here is that Paul is saying Jesus is Yahweh. Whoever calls on, he's talking about Jesus, right? Whoever, whoever believes, whoever confesses with their mouth that Jesus is Lord, that Jesus is Yahweh. I mean, the Greek word there is Kyrios, but uh, I think that that is the logical inference we can draw from this. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. And then he, so it's a context talking about Jesus. And then he quotes Joel calling on the name of the Lord. Uh, every, anyone who does that will be saved. So, um, we had Trinity Sunday uh, last Sunday, and um, I think that, that is, that's, a, that's a big deal. Uh, we just had Jehovah's Witnesses come by, and we talked, they deny this. Jesus is not Yahweh. Uh, Jesus is um, the Son of God, and they, they, they do violence to the text in a lot of ways in order to skirt the fact that these connections are being made for us. Um, and what they do essentially is they, they, uh, they eliminate the mystery of it. And, um, uh, that was, that was the, uh, he was like, well, the almighty is one, right? And I said, yes, Deuteronomy six, four, the Shema hero, Israel, the Lord is one. And, uh, he goes, well, then the almighty can't be two, right? And I said, well, he's one in substance and he's three in persons. We have God, the father, God, the son, and God, the spirit. And they're all one. They're three in one. Uh, diversity and unity. Um, and it's a mystery. And that's okay. And he goes, well, it's not a mystery to me. And I said, well, that's because you believe a heresy. <laughs> 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 and that's what heresies do. Heresies give this comfort of eradicating mystery. And they do so by doing violence to the text, by doing these subtle things that make it to where we don't have to abide in mystery. It gets rid of, it's kind of this, it's this Chestertonian uh, 
the, the, the madman rationality. It's reason in this kind of gross, uh, sterile, and clinical way. All heresies are like this. Um, all cults are like this. It gets rid of the mystery, and it gives you certainty. It gives you certainty that you're in the one true church. And um, I think um, I've thought about this a lot. It's, it, it's like, why, why is the deity of Christ always the thing that's attacked with these cults? And I think uh, Jeff Durbin has done a, a good job of kind of explaining. I mean, it's to, I mean, I online the kind of anti there, are, the anti Trinitarianism. If you are in that realm, it is rabid. It is, I mean, it, it is very intense. And I the only thing I would describe there's a kind of a spiritual frenzy to mock Trinitarians um, in their kind of for for being illogical, for being unreasonable. But I've thought about this, and I, I think, uh, yeah, Jeff Durbin has, has talked about this. And I think what it is, is um, if, you can, if you can put forward a different Christ, then you can put forward a different gospel. And that's what, that's what goes on with these uh, cults, with Jehovah's Witnesses, Mormons, Islam. G Jesus is just a prophet. He only appeared to die. All of these things are uh, ways of diminishing uh, Christ as... Yahweh. And so what I think we see here is uh, the three, per there's similar associations with the Holy Spirit is Yahweh. Um, and so this is what it means to call on the name of the Lord. All, all of it culminating in Jesus, all of it culminating in Christ. Um, Jesus says of Abraham that he looked forward to my day. And so when Abraham is calling on the name of the Lord, he knew something. There was something revealed to him. He, he, he rejoiced to see his day. To, and, and so um, all the prophets, starting from the antediluvian world till now, when they call on the name of the Lord, they're calling on Christ. And so um, this is something that Abram does, not just once in his life. He actually does it, I think, a total of three times. And so I think that that's also something while uh, I mentioned that straightforward simplicity, I think the evangelical realm um, rightly just kind of affirms the simplicity of, hey, if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, Jesus is Lord, you will be saved. But what does that mean? I believe Jesus is Lord. <laughs> and if you really believe that, you are justified by faith in that moment. There is a righteousness imputed to you. You can stand before the Lord. You can approach him uh, in boldness and then everything else that it entails with calling on the name of the Lord, repentance, purity of life, service to God, um, all of these things are also involved in it. But I think it's uh, the, the pitfall that evangelicals uh, can fall into is making it punctiliar, that calling on the name of the Lord, confessing Jesus as Lord, believing in your heart. It's just this one time thing. And that's when you were saved. But Abram calls on the name of the Lord multiple times. And um, I, it is something, if you look in the Psalms too, um, calling on the name uh, or calling on the Lord is something that is done uh, daily. Uh, and it's also something that's done until we die. And so it's a lifetime of um, this kind of uh, calling out to God and asking him to deliver us, petitioning him, stirring ourselves up to take a hold of him. And by doing this, uh, Yahweh will save us uh, to the utmost. Let's pray. The charge is this. Can anyone guess? Can anyone guess what the charge is going to be? Call on the name of the Lord. Call on the name of the Lord. Call on the name of Yahweh. Expect him to answer your petitions with power, with demonstrations of power. Do this as you offer your body as a sacrifice. Do this in gratitude. Do this to deliver your soul from the wickedness of this world and the wickedness of your own sin. Do this to stir yourself up so that you can take hold of God and be blessed by him and walk with a limp for the rest of your life. Do this in the purity of your lips and in order to serve him. Do this in the presence of other believers. Gather together. Don't forsake the assembly as is the habit of some. Do this to call down wrath and vengeance on those who are stiff-necked. Do this as people who are saved, 
who are being saved and who will be saved. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and amen.